What's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another Vanguard live stream. Today we're talking with very special guest Ryan Grimm. Funny enough, our most controversial interview guest of all time on the Vanguard, returning for another interview. So super excited, as always, to talk to Ryan. How are you doing, Zach, before we get started? Good, good. You know, I was talking to Gavin a little bit. We were strategizing. We were like, how are we going to bounce back after this? And we, we were looking at, you know, rising and breaking points. And we realized that the model for success on YouTube was to have one uh, left winger, one right winger. So I'm going to eat the L. I got a haircut, became a Republican. I joke. Uh, actually, really excited to uh, talk to Ryan today. Always a good conversation. Obviously, there's going to be a few, uh, you know, uh, maybe a little, maybe some skeptical people in our audience, maybe some unhappy people in our audience, but you know, that comes with the terrain. Super excited to chat with the guy. It's been a long time. Uh, it'll be good to catch up. Yeah, absolutely. As always, you know that we guys like, or that we, uh, start our live streams with a big shout out to the patron community. So before we get Ryan in here, let's shout out the patrons. Thank you so much to everyone supporting the show. Uh, that link is going to be found in the description. It's patreon.com slash the Vanguard channel. And as you guys know, it's in the description of this live stream. It's in the description of all of our videos. So hit that up. If you're a fan of the show, if you like the content we create and want to support us, it really is appreciated. And as we always say, the patrons make this show possible. It's very, very true. So huge shout out. Thank you guys so much for the support. Again, you make the show possible. And if you would like to join the patron community, then hit up that link in the description. But yeah, like I said, about to chat with Mr. Ryan Grimm once again, our most controversial guest of all time on the Vanguard. Uh, so super excited to get into lots of topics today. Honestly, we have a lot of stuff wanting to ask Ryan about. Um, so super excited about that. Uh, I guess without further ado, might as well just welcome the man himself to the Vanguard. Thanks so much for joining us today, Ryan. How you doing? If I am your most controversial guest, you got you to gotta step up to controversy. You and Glenn have to battle it out because that's the two that we get emailed about the most for very different reasons. But I, I find it uh, a, a little funny considering you guys were, were former colleagues. Interesting. Interesting. But yeah. anyway, uh, how you doing? Good. I'm, I'm good. I'm hanging in like I, I like I'm oh God, let me deal with that dog in a second. Like I mentioned to you, I was at a show this weekend and about half the people I was with have already tested positive for COVID. Uh, and I don't feel great, but still negative. Let me go put this dog somewhere. Be right back. For people who don't know, the infamous show that Ryan is referencing here was the legendary Madison Square Garden multi-night performance by uh, uh, Fish. Which, uh, you know, normally I'm not like the biggest fish head. I, I, I think Ryan might jump on here and, and make the case for fish a, as a big fish head. But they did have quite a legendary show this weekend that actually made its way into my uh, purview uh, beforehand. So I actually will be interested in quickly uh, getting uh, Ryan's reaction, live reaction to those whales. And maybe they were worth uh, potentially contracting the novel coronavirus. But uh, yeah, yeah, Ryan, uh, uh, I, we were given a little bit of an introduction to the fact that you got to see the whales over the weekend. Was it worth contracting potentially the novel coronavirus? Ask, ask me maybe in a week or two, but I try to live life without regrets. So, you know, we'll, I guess we'll see is the, is the answer to that one. Awesome. Well, I guess we can go ahead and dive in and, and actually uh, start talking to you uh, about politics, start talking to you a little bit about what's going on in the world. Obviously, for people who uh, don't know you, if you're watching our show, you probably do. You're the D.C. Bureau Chief for The Intercept. You're uh, a contributor of The Hills Rising. And uh, recently, I believe it was announced that you'll be, uh, be making uh, contributions uh, elsewhere on the Internet as well. And uh, I guess I just wanted to see if you had any um, opening announcements that you wanted to make obviously uh any comments on the fact that you're going to be uh uh joining uh team breaking points to do uh, uh some no yeah we're like i'm going to try to come by um with other intercept reporters as often as possible to like you know talk about whatever breaking reporting we've got um you know, we'll see you know how and when we can fit that in and work around this their studio schedule um, but I'm I'm ex I'm excited about that. We you know Intercept doesn't have a really much of a presence on on YouTube on video, and so I, you know it's a good chance to like get our get our reporting out there, and then people can argue about like what we what we've reported. But it's nice to have like ni nice to give people a chance to see what reporting we're doing. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited to see your contributions over there. And I do miss seeing you as part of the Crystal Saga um, panel, regular kind of a, a thing. I, I do miss you back on Rising when it was you guys instead of now. Uh, speaking of Rising, did want to talk a little bit about something we were discussing on our stream last night. And that was this tweet by Kim Iverson, your co-host on Rising. She's been talking about this hit piece the daily beast has run i think it's in today's edition of the daily beast talking about how some of her co-workers have disdain for her views regarding covid uyghurs ukraine etc and then running off to management whining about it um of course some people were speculating that perhaps it was you who had you know tattled to the to the daily beast but as she clarified that it was not you know it was not ryan Grimm. however i just wanted to get your opinion on this whole debacle what you think about that daily beast piece and um who you think may have uh gone to them in the first place right and they reached out to me um right around the time that kim was uh posting this i, I sent her the the request for comment um i think it's pretty clear from once the piece came out like what the context is and who who it would have been because what they said is what the what the daily beast says is that the staff is in an uproar and they and they think that you know in the wake of the john solomon controversy that this is further damaging the journalistic credibility of the hill so this is these are hill people like that's not me like that's not emily jashinsky that's not robbie like they, we're not hill people i'm the, I'm the intercept i appear you know on hill tv um emily is the federalist robbie is reason like we do this show for hill tv but none of us have none of us care i mean i i go i hope the hill has nice credibility but that's i don't write for the hill i'm not a reporter for the hill the hill is the hill.com is a big news outlet that has lots of reporters who do you know basically straight news reporting about about politics and they were very frustrated it was very public that they were extremely frustrated about this guy john solomon who was doing all this reporting about uh ukraine and i, I don't remember all everything he did you know a lot of ukraine like corruption type stuff related to democrats and a lot of the hill reporters felt like it was thinly sourced that basically he was just taking like rudy giuliani stuff and just pumping it into an opinion column and because he was in the opinion side the hill.com you know the hill news side felt like he was damaging their brand so and so now what they're saying is now they think kim is damaging their brand so it's clear i don't know who i don't know what particular reporters are saying that but it's clear that th that's that's what's going on here they think that kim is another kind of john solomon type that is hurting the hill staff and it's funny that because out out of the twitter and youtube world when people hear like the hill all they think of is like rising right <laughs> they don't they don't know that that's like that's a staff of like seven compared to a staff yeah. of like a hundred on the news side right well like, just oh there's a whole news outlet the hill like, right no yeah that's <laughs> that's who's pissed off like, yeah yeah well i'm interested in what your opinion on this you know dynamic is because personally as a viewer of rising i really enjoy the fact that sometimes the co-hosts butt heads a little bit and aren't afraid to get into those kind of messy er areas of disagreements and hash out the uh the beef so to speak um but what, what's your opinion i mean do you like being co-host with someone like Kim Iverson, who clearly you uh, disagree with a fair amount and have you know significantly different perspectives on certain matters, would you rather uh, host a show with someone like that who you're able to um, do that kind of debate with, or would you rather uh, they have someone on who has you know a, a viewpoints that are more aligned with your own? I do think that debate's important, and I I do enjoy it. I think that if there's a viewpoint out there that has like a substantial you know meaningful political movement behind it and it's and it's being aired anyway that it need it there's you ought to grapple with it like you should go back and forth with it you should you know allow it to make its points and then make your counterpoints uh so yeah i'm like i i wouldn't be on a show like rising if i thought that you know there should only be I, I, that I should only talk with people I agree with. So I, I take it that you would agree with Zach and I's position then that um, this whole this whole uh, argument about 
a platform like the hill or a company like the hill platforming someone and that being dangerous i take it that you would agree that that's kind of a immature um way to approach this at least in my opinion intellectually so it's a little bit immature and rather to do what you have done which is to engage in debate and discourse rather than clamoring for someone's censorship of course we've seen this with joe rogan and i really thought it was great how a guy like ben burgess you know instead of advocating for his censorship he went on the joe rogan experience and they discuss their areas of disagreement um Mm -hmm. in the same way you do that with kim iverson and i just think that's a much more Uh, a a much better look for the left, you know, that we're okay with and eager to engage in these debates rather than clamoring for censorship, which is a troubling trend I I see in in at least parts of the left. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Yeah. I wouldn't be on there if, if I didn't think that like, yeah. And I think one of the things that you guys have ironed out really well over there as well, you know, especially, I mean, you know, the, between Robbie, Kim, the lineup, obviously we disagree massively. We, we do uh, segments on our show about it sometimes, but I think what's really uh, uh, nice about uh, the way that it's all situated and sorted out now is like, you know, Robbie is a libertarian. If you read Robbie five years ago, Robbie Swove is a libertarian. He's been writing libertarian shit that I massively disagree with, but the guy is a libertarian, right? I think on Chapo in like 2016, they did an episode called the Rove to Swa- road to Swavdom. And he was like on there making the case against the Chapo guys and like, no, we need small government. And they were like, you know, okay. So he's, you know, he's, he's ironclad in that. If you go back and you watch the Kim Iverson show from four years ago, she has this heterodox worldview that I think she still embodies. If you go back and, you know, look at your reporting, Ryan, I think you've been, you know, on the, on the side of uh, progressive politics, you know, for a, a ways back. Right. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's clear that everybody conviction and where they are in this uh you know ideologically ba- ideological battleground that you guys have kind of constructed for yourself i think is really healthy for you know honestly the way that the american electorate is kind of divided right there are a lot of people uh especially younger people that do identify as economically libertarian in the same way that robbie does and i think that it's good for those individuals who might be there to you know hear robbie's perspective hear a little bit of pushback and say like no um you know kim iverson might say i actually am okay with this government spending or you'll be like well here's actually why we're going to get this return on investment for every dollar that we spend on you know x y issue um so yeah i actually i've been really impressed with the way that the, the show has has evolved and uh you know gavin and i enjoy this viewers a lot yeah and, and um I think that people trust it more actually uh, when they're getting, when they're hearing different perspectives, because rather than being fed just one perspective and like, whether it's Fox or MSNBC or CNN, and you know, it's all coming from the same direction and and they're just saying, trust us, like we're giving you the truth. We're fair and balanced or we're whatever we are. Like if you're getting at at the same time, multiple different perspectives, then you feel like everyone is being honest with you, even if you don't agree with everybody there. And if you don't think they're being honest, you, you like to see them getting called on it. Like, yeah, and I think that has a lot to do with, um, you know, I mean, people have been saying and clamoring for that a, a lot, it feels like, right? Like you hear a lot mm-hmm. in the broad ether of people, maybe, you know, people who don't do this for a living that are like obsessively covering every news outlet. Um, but, you know, if you're just like, Brad, oh, I, I wish you could get just like, you know, everybody's perspective from one place. Or it's like, why do you have to go to one place for this and, and one place for that? And I think that um, you're right that that does deepen people's trust because now you have actually gotten, you know, the full throated debate of of each side. Uh, and it's, you know, just um, they're on a uh, morning YouTube show. It's really interesting that this is, you know, as CNN plus crumbles, they can't figure out uh, how to stay in business, how to keep people's eyes on them. Uh, yet there's this honestly this like blueprint for it which is <laughs> hey let's have people with heterodox ideas sometimes people that i have views that i you know i i really detest right sometimes it's like wow i can't believe you're a functioning person that argues this but we're gonna fucking you know get here we're gonna take our 15 20 minutes you know politely have our discourse um and move and, and that's what people are craving so it's just very uh, odd to me to see the entire news apparatus um, you know, ignore that very obvious uh, roadmap that you guys have yeah. kind of laid out over there. Uh, and maybe it's just because, uh, you know, the juice isn't worth the squeeze for them. They don't actually want people thinking about that sounds conspiratorial. But like, what do you think about that? Why do you think other uh, news organizations won't jump on that uh, model? I don't I don't know. Um, and so I, I think so in July or August, uh, Newsmax, not Newsmax, what's it? Next Star. Um, the brain fog going on. Next star um bought the the hill front like the hill used to be owned by this like rich guy named Jimmy Finkelstein. Yeah, Trump guy, right? 
he was a country club Republican who I think made him like basically like like a lot of other country club Republicans who were in business made appeased Trump. Like I don't think he was a pro Trump guy originally, but if you know once he's in power, those types of Republicans are going to be like, okay, well we we're going to work with this. This guy's going to cut taxes, and whatever. Uh, so he was the he was the owner. He sold it to this publicly traded company called Nexstar, which owns like 200 local news stations and also owns a cable news station that almost nobody's heard of called News Nation. And News Nation's idea is that people don't trust cable news anymore. And they're they're completely right. Like that that insight is correct. I, I don't think their answer, though, to it is going to work long term. Like their answer to it is we're going to give you straight news like MSNBC and CNN are left. Fox is right. We're going to come down the middle and we're going to give you the truth. And I can understand why intuitively in a, in like an executive meeting, you might think that there's space for that because it's true that people don't trust meeting anymore, but I don't think that's the right answer just because people aren't going to believe like the right. If you say you're coming at them down the middle, the right will think you're a bunch of left wingers. The left, if you say that is like, well, CNN is coming down the middle. Like you know, liberals think that CNN is just straight down the middle. So why do they need another one? Uh, and so there's no there's no audience there. So if they instead took the show that they actually now own, Rising, and took that model and did like 24-hour cable news around it, I think that they'd have a shot. Like if they also incorporated YouTube and social media and streaming, you know, where people are, because you can't just live on cable. Like that's yeah, but I, I think, like, yeah, but I don't know if they'll do it. That's I mean, not, they'd be wise to, and yeah. and just anecdotally, myself and a lot of people I know. I mean, I certainly enjoy watching shows where there is those disagreements and where there is a variety of viewpoints. It's one of the reasons why I like Breaking Points so much, even though I disagree with probably you know a, a good percentage of what Sagar says. Um, I enjoy seeing the back and forth between him and a left wing voice and Crystal Ball, and then obviously the other you know, people that have joined the Breaking Points network as well. It kind of reminds me of um, uh, the what TYT was doing back in the day. You know, now they have Jordan Sheraton on board as well. Um, it seems like they're kind of doing more of a network style thing, but unlike with TYT, less of an echo chamber, which I like because mm -hmm. it's always a little bit boring to me when you tune in and you just know exactly what you're going to hear from the hosts and you know exactly who the guests are going to be and what they're going to say. Um, mm -hmm. I prefer to have a, a different um lineup of, of opinions and, and voices so you know just personally i think it's a, a much more entertaining and, and intellectually engaging model just to pivot a little bit ryan i did want to talk a little bit about the nina turner race obviously you're uh, you have your ear to the ground on electoral politics and democratic party races and all that stuff so specifically i wanted to talk about the nina turner race and the john fetterman senate race in pennsylvania but let's start with Nina Turner, something that a lot of people commented on, including us here at the Vanguard, was the fact that Premier Jayapal, the head of the Progressive um, Caucus in Congress, essentially endorsed um, uh, Chantel Brown, right, who's the incumbent um, Democrat in the Ohio district in which Nina Turner is running and got a lot of backlash for this. This is just a random Newsweek article that I pulled up about Su Susan Sarandon slamming Premier Jayapal for abandoning the people. Um, what was your opinion? Did you predict this? Because I know a lot of people have pointed out that, well, the Progressive Caucus just endorses incumbent Democrats regardless of who they are. Um, so were you expecting this? And, and also, more importantly, do you think that it's actually going to hurt Nina Turner's chance? What do you think <coughs> Nina Turner's chances are? And how do you think they're impacted by this endorsement of Chantel Brown? I mean, I should have predicted this. I didn't. I didn't quite think about it. But it's a it's a clever move by Chantel Brown. You know, as soon as she got to Congress, you know, she applied to join the Congressional Progressive Caucus, uh, and you know, it, it's it, it's easy to join. Like one, they they now have tighter rules about what you have to do once you've joined. Like you you can only break with them a certain percentage of time. And so it used to be you could do whatever you want. Um. So she joined, so she applied to join, of course, you know, she's going to get in. Uh, and then several months later, you know, applied to the PAC, which is a slightly separate organization for an endorsement. And their policy had always been um, to 
uh, you know, to just endorse. If you're a member, CPC member, you get you get endorsed. Uh, I had heard that Rokana was saying internally we should we should stay neutral. We make sure we stay neutral. And so there was there, you know, p- people have agency, like the CPC, you know, leadership, uh, Pramil Jayapal, you know, Omar, like all, all across the board, like there, there is some agency where you could say, look, we're going to do a different process for this because we, you know, a lot of people have supported Nina Turner last time she's running again, and we're gonna have a separate vote. We're going to make sure everybody knows about the vote like that. That was a path that could have been taken. Um, it would have, it would have infuriated the congressional black caucus who, even though it, there's two black women running against each other, this the Congressional Black Caucus is strongly in support of uh, Chantel Brown, was last time, is again this time, and also has a, has this like intense like hostility to all of these Justice Democrat kind of insurgencies. Like they, they feel like it's directed specifically against them. And I, and I suspect that there was with that, they had that in mind a little bit while they, and, and just allowed the process to go through the normal normal channels knowing that if you if it just goes through the normal channels it's just going to be a rubber stamp like here's I've, i was told she went through with eight other members like here's a slate of eight members who want the pack endorsement all in favor i i you know moving on you know to our potluck next wednesday and just boom it's over and then and then when it comes out it's like you you see just people just just outraged like how on earth is it that the congressional progressive caucus like the caucus founded by bernie sanders is endorsing against bernie's against the candidate bernie sanders endorsed i think sanders endorsed turner like the day before or something right which made it that much more kind of jarring yeah it's it happen. yeah it's really interesting and i think that you know one one of the things that makes people pessimistic, right, uh, about the future of, of the, you know, let's call it the broader squad umbrella, right? Uh, recently, we've been really pr- critical of Pramil- Pramia Jayapal and Rokana, you know, people debate whether or not they're under the squad umbrella. Let's just say for the sake of this argument that we're talking about anybody that could vote in the, the way that we want to in, a, in any given situation on, you know, something that progressives value. Uh, you know, uh, the fact that none of them uh, will meaningfully kind of stick their neck out uh, to get more um, candidates in office, I think is a big red flag for encouraging people to continue to go at this mission the way that we have been. And I'm in, interested in hearing, you know, what you think about all this, Ryan, because typically we have a little bit of a different perspective on this matter uh, when it comes to the, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to the fact that, you know, we need to be a little more, um, uh, from my pr- pr- uh, view, aggressive uh, with how we push the squad, uh, to put it that way. And, and I think that, you know, if you look at the fact that the progressive energy uh, since Bernie Sanders, right, it's just I mean, if it, it would just be like a graph down this since Bernie Sanders got out of the presidential race in 2020 and endorsed Joe Biden. I mean, the amount of energy on the progressive left has just been tanking so dramatically. Right. And and I think a lot of people uh, are looking at this w- one way or the other, like the, the Nina Turner race kind of feels like uh, the final bellwether in what was the Bernie Sanders movement. And, you know, yes, in the special election, she lost by what was it? Four thousand votes. You can make up four thousand votes, but that's a much taller hill to climb when you don't have the excitement the bernie sanders movement now she's an incumbent now she can tell that she's been endorsed by the progressive caucus now she can call nina turner a sore loser that's right to sabotage her uh you know and then uh, on top of all of the other things that are going around like and nina turner now really trying to toe the line on her support for things like israel which is going to further infuriate the progressive left when she says things like no i don't support uh bds i do support israel uh, i will be a supporter of israel you know these kinds of things where it's like yeah she's trying to get in but as she's doing that she's actually alienating a lot of the uh you know her more hardcore leftist base and this was a big problem that a lot of people had with bernie sanders because he also uh you know didn't get behind the bds movement just use that as an example um 
So I, I'm just wondering, one, do you think that Nina Turner has a chance? Because I want to believe that she does, but my analytical brain is telling me the energy isn't there. The uh, odds are so dramatically stacked against her. And on top of that, nobody from the squad like AOC is going to try and come in and save her. AOC wouldn't even endorse Cori Bush when she was able to unseat the Lacey Clay dynasty, which she did basically single fucking handedly with the support of the people of St. Louis. So it, it just I don't know if it's going to happen for her. Uh, am I being overly pessimistic uh, or, or would you say it's going to be a really really tall uh hill to climb you know what i mean so, so it's gonna i mean i think she can win it's possible but i think you're right that it's tougher uh even than it was last time the the, the enthusiasm does seem like it's like it's down and there's also less i think there's also a sense among people that for what like what's the seat for it's it, it, it's a seat in the minority you know probably in the minority in order to the best argument you can make is to build a stronger more progressive democratic party for the 10 years from now or so you know when the party comes back into power so that they actually do take advantage of their opportunity next time so i think that combined with all the other things plus there's this you know million a couple million a million dollars or so from the crypto backed pack that's going for Chantel brown you know that's that's gonna that's going to matter because this this money really starts to add up. Uh, you know, DMFI pack, you know, may spend significantly in the race as well. I think just structurally, the left really can't rely on um, progressives inside Congress to help them win insurgent races. Like if if they can if they can pressure them to do it in some cases, like with Jamal Bowman, um, great. But I think they should. People should think of that as a, as a, as a nice to have, rather than something that's going to. Sure. Structurally, once they get into the system, like they're now they they represent this district. They've got the, they're cross pressured in a million different ways. They are working with these colleagues every day, and if you can elect people who can resist all of that pressure and still be, you know, firebrands that that support insurgents great but like there's very few of those out right there. i mean bernie sanders didn't do it mm -hmm. well one question i have for you is uh as zach referenced a lot of times the, the squad members the progressives in congress whatever you want to call them um when people call on them to enact a certain strategy obviously force the vote comes to mind but there are other instances of this being the case a lot of times they will deflect and say well we would do something like that, but there's not enough of us. You know, we need a stronger army. We need a bigger faction in order to really use our leverage in a serious way. Um, but as Zach said, they have an opportunity here with Nina Turner to strengthen their numbers. And not only is the Progressive Caucus not endorsing her, her but a lot of the individual squad members themselves are not even weighing in. So that seems to basically be antithetical to their entire theory of change uh so do, do you understand uh and do you sympathize with people's frustration with the strategy and, and their kind of uh their uh sense that the squad members have kind of sold out their movement in favor of a more careerist approach i think i think that that contradiction is a fair one to point out like all right we want more or we don't have we don't have the numbers to do this yet um but then we're not endorsing all these all of these different candidates because we're worried about you know undermining our own power in the like and, and it's a it's a structural contradiction that it, that uh that exists and unless they have some other way out of it um then then yeah that's a that's a perfectly fair complaint and actually like as as you as you talk about it i think if in if in like january 4th or 2nd or whatever before the force the vote thing people said you know what that if you guys don't do this thing this maneuver that they want you to do on the floor to get your floor vote for medicare for all then like two hundred thousand people are going to check out then i would say you know what just do it <laughs> like, like if like it's not it's not that big a deal and, and that was a lot of my take at the time i was like look and and you, i'm sure people can find like versions of this at the time like I can see arguments for it. I can see arguments against it. I don't see it as a smart tactical move at the moment. 
Yeah, but, and, 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 and he, hot yeah. button example that we would m maybe find even more agreement on was the fact that, uh, you know, yeah. actually one of the last things we discussed was the the combining of the infrastructure bills. Uh, you know, Premier Jayapal agreed uh, to let them, uh, you know, do a bipartisan right. bill and bill pack better. I think we can all agree that was a terrible strategy, as right. we knew before uh, she did that. I was like, well, we're getting. Uh, you know, the bipartisan bill, they're going to point to that and say, oh, you know, we tried. And then when the Republicans run a train on the Democrats uh, in the midterms and steal it like they haven't since 2010, um, you know, then, of course, we'll just hear about how, well, of course, now nothing can, can get done. Right. No. Yeah. That, that was a that's that's another example. But yeah, uh, it's, you know. Oh my God. So I have two cats, as, yeah, as you've maybe seen on, on air here before. Um, we also run an animal house. It's no big deal. And the dog has now seen the cats and is freaking out. Give me one second. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, it looks like we have a couple other stories we wanted to get to and ask Ryan about. One in specific that I'm excited to hear his opinion on because he has done some reporting on this race is the Senate race in Pennsylvania. Finally, the Democratic candidates have debated and Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman is, of course, the front runner running away with this race by double digits. He's almost certainly going to win the nomination um, but as it says here in this Politico article, Fetterman has come under fire in the first televised debate. Of course, all of his opponents are trying desperately to take him out of the running before the actual uh, the primary day, which is coming up in a couple weeks here. Um, and as it says here, there's a specific incident from back in 2013 that obviously all of his candidates, all of his you know fellow opponents in this race are bringing to the forefront, trying to really um, define the race with. And that is this instance in which Fetterman actually pulled a shotgun on an unarmed black man when he was the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania in 2013. Um, Fetterman says that uh, he made a split second decision to call 911, get his son to safety and intercept the individual, the only individual uh, out running when the gun gunfire came. So basically he heard gunfire. He thought that this was like uh, going to be a mass shooting type of scenario. At least that's what he says. Um, and, and so he pulled out his shotgun and, and I guess pretty much like detained this jogger uh, kind of like vigilante style. So, you know, <laughs> Regardless of how you feel about Fetterman, and I think he's definitely the best candidate in this race, at least as far as policy goes, um, this is an unfortunate incident. There's just no way to slice it. Um, even with his justification, it's still pretty hard to look past. And, and obviously, his opponents are going to try to define him with this story. Again, anyone uh, that's in a political race against someone else would use this to their advantage. Um, but I'm wondering, Ryan, if you think there's any chance this will actually stop Fetterman from winning the Democratic nomination. Um, uh, if you think that these attacks are going to be successful, um, and also just what you think about Fetterman in general as a candidate, because like I said, um, he's still the best when it comes to policy, as far as, you know, a kind of populist left economic agenda, in my opinion. Yeah. My guess is it's probably too late for this stuff to dramatically change the course of the, of the primary that they're voting in what? A week or two is it may 7th or may 13th or something like that it's soon um and in pennsylvania like this this incident has been known about you know for a fairly long time there there might be voters that that don't know about it that, that are hearing about it for the first time and you, you you laid it out pretty pretty accurately the only the only disagreement between fetterman a guy he pulled the gun on is the guy he pulled the gun on claims that Fetterman pointed the gun at him. And until the police showed up, Fetterman says he just kind of held the shotgun up. up. Yeah. It's like, I mean, yeah. and I, I once had a cop point a gun right at my face. And like, there is something visceral. Like I can still see the barrel of it um, about having it pointed at you, knowing that your life now depends on whether or not this person pulls a trigger or not um which is slightly different than when the gun's like held to the side um but that's the only disagreement like otherwise well, everybody agrees that this is this is what happened there had there had been some school shooting or something the day before this though was a saturday so schools weren't open there could be a doesn't mean there can't be a shooting somewhere else 
people do say that worse there's either fireworks or or gunshots so that part's fair um he claims he didn't know that the jogger was black that s- stretches the imagination like i don't quite understand how you would not know that um was it like pitch black outside and the dude was all covered up it was like middle of the day yeah that's yeah and the guy has since since went to uh prison for an unrelated thing um and from prison wrote a letter to the philly of philly of inquirer or some, or some paper i think it was inquirer interviewed him and he's like i don't think he should have done this but i actually don't want it to get in the way of him being the senator so that was kind of gracious uh coming from this yeah. guy agreed um, um but so but if if this type of thing were happening which you where you've got millions of dollars of super PAC spending from basically wall street coming in to like crush a democratic front runner who's up by 20 points mm-hmm. um and, and drive their negatives into the ground uh and if 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 the left were doing that to like connor lamb you know you'd have the entire party just absolutely freaking out about how mm-hmm. the left doesn't care about democrats right. they just want to elect republicans and yeah, no, it's it's super ironic that they have a candidate here that actually could potentially win this race in a tough election cycle, and they're basically trying to destroy him by running these negative ads. Even though, like I said, I mean, it is legitimate to talk about this. Right. I think that if you know Connor Lamb had had done this in his past, we would be talking about it. So I think it's fair to discuss. But at the same time, I agree that it is pretty ironic that the Democratic Party has a potentially you know winning candidate here that could actually take down the Republican who will most likely be. Uh, the Trump endorsed Dr. Oz, and instead they're trying to destroy him. I guess that leads me to another question. And uh, if anyone's watching that's been watching for a while, you guys might remember um, even just a couple of weeks ago, a month or so ago, Zach and I were pretty excited about John Fetterman because he does represent this more um, uh, anti-establishment kind of populist left economic Democrat that I think is a better kind of Democrat to run in a purple state like Pennsylvania. Um, And again, he supports a lot of the same policies I do, whether it's unions or legalizing cannabis. He's also outspoken when it comes to stuff like trans rights, which I appreciate. Um, So, you know, I I really I like Fetterman for the most part. However, uh, a couple weeks ago, he put out a really, really disappointing statement, in my opinion, about Israel. And he was, you know, actually separating himself from the squad members by saying that their approach to the subject matter by embracing BDS was misguided and that he thought it was um, he thought it was, you know, problematic. And to me, that really, I mean, if that's how he actually feels, I, I mean, I guess it's better that he'd be honest about it. But to me, it kind of, it seemed like pandering in a way that I hadn't seen much from John Fetterman. It seemed like he was really trying to cozy up to the establishment and knowing how influential APAC is. He didn't want to get on their bad side, being a potential Democratic nominee. Uh, so I'm just wondering, in your opinion, Ryan, do you think this guy's actually a threat to the Democratic establishment, to the establishment at large? Or do you think he's kind of just like a wolf in sheep's clothing? Like he's just kind of a corporate Democrat that's running as a populist in order to uh, win some Pennsylvania voters that might have like a Bernie Sanders kind of a political instinct? Well, kind of two two things there. I think on that particular issue of Israel-Palestine, you're seeing a lot more pandering from left-wing candidates after what they successfully did to Nina Turner um, and you know how, and how much money they spent on against Jamal Bowman didn't didn't beat him but showed like you know, this enormous spending spree. Um, you've seen a couple other candidates who have kind of proactively put out statements that very that very clearly are aimed at at telling either DMFI or like the the new APAC PAC uh, that look uh, you know we're we're not a huge threat. Like we don't agree with you on everything here, but we're not going to be cutting off military aid um, as our first vote. You know, we're not going to be an outspoken supporter of Palestinian rights. Like you're you're starting to see that people trying to send that message because then they hope that this multi million dollar flood of money through these super PACs won't land on them, and then they they can they can then fight on these other issues. And you're seeing it similarly play out with crypto in some races where these giant crypto packs are coming into races and you're seeing some candidates be like, you know what? Fine. Like what, what do you, what's your crypto policies? I'm good with it. Like, I don't care. Like, 
Yeah, I think that that's kind of disappointing, though, right? And it kind of shows a, a, a willingness to seed ground in a way that I think people should be massively uncomfortable with. Obviously, we've got this intercept piece right here for me, Ryan. Uh, Crypto Pack throws in 1 million to back Ohio rep Chantel Brown over Nina Turner. Uh, I've got some other uh, numbers right here from friend of the show, Jordan Cheriton. Uh, you know, a week out from Nina Turner's primary in Cleveland. Multiple pro-Israel groups are again trying to buy the election for Chantel Brown. This is a crazy number. Pro-Israel America PAC total $781,566 on uh, Ohio congressional race. Like, that's a shit ton of money. Uh, you know, and as he says, still crickets from AOC Rashida to leave the whole fucking gamut. Uh, and so, you know. Is that all it takes to get the progressive movement to fold on its fucking values? Like, oh, this is going to be a pain in the ass for you to get elected if you, uh, you know, keep supporting this apartheid state with a bunch of our fucking money. Uh, hey, like, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, the apartheid state wants to keep going. The oligarchs don't want me to do that. Yeah, well, they don't want us to have fucking health care either. They don't want us to have $15 an hour. They don't want us to have a Green New Deal. So, do you, you know, I just feel like this is this is a bad omen, man. Like, yeah. This guy, big old, I wear a car hard and basketball shorts in 30 degree weather every day. John Fetterman can't pick up a fight against APAC. Keep, yeah. I mean, at, at least make the argument, oh, we need to keep our dollars at home. If Israel wants to, you know, be, be a nation, then fuck it. Good luck. Like, do it without our money. Yeah, at the very least, right? Uh, setting aside the fucking crimes because not we don't necessarily have tall footing on that one. But um, you know what I mean? I, 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 just, I just think that if we're going to go down that rabbit hole, if we're going to be like, well, you know, they're going to spend a lot of money on our progressive guys to, if they, if they don't sell out, you know, the Palestinians, like, whew, what are we saying about ourselves there? Yeah, no. And this, this is, this is the result of, of the system we have and of, of losing. So Bernie Sanders got a ton of DMFI money spent against him in Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and, and won. And DMFI threw in the, Threw in the towel. Like that's how you that's how you beat that big money is with people vote, voting for you anyway. Uh, he ended up losing, but not because of DMFI money. If they had thrown in several million dollars against Nina Turner, Nina Turner wins. Um, then maybe next time, people, you know, candidates stick by it, or or DMFI decides, you know, this isn't the way to play it. Um, and as long as you and as long as you don't have a kind of public financing system or a matching fund system where where people can raise money that's equal, you're going to have these candidates who are, you know, in in the end they're trying to win their races, and th so they're going to do what they need to do to win. It's it becomes a collective action problem. It's like you should not, uh, you know, cave to crypto just to get to Congress, but if you don't really care, then you're running for Congress. And you don't really care that much about crypto. And are you going to be the one who's going to lose fighting to stand up to crypto? Or are you going to be like, you know what? This questionnaire you're filling in sure sounds reasonable. I'm running for Medicare for all and fight for 15 and like not, not for this. So I, I'm not going to end my political career over, over this crap, but you're exactly right. Where does that stop? Then you're like, well, I'm not going to end my political career over Israel, Palestine. And you're like, well, I'm not going to end my political career over and then it gets easy to like continue to make those compromises if there isn't a countervailing progressive force on the other side that's going to say if you if you say no to DMFI, you say no to these crypto packs, like we're we've got we've got your back with people and we've got your back with money. And right now, the left doesn't really have that infrastructure to to answer in these lower races. Maybe at the presidential level, but not at the. House Isn't level. that the fundamental failure that we have to look back and reflect on, though? Because we had those mechanisms like a year and a half ago, two years ago. You know what I mean? We had the mechanisms to to put people in those power. And so I guess, you know, my la my last question along these lines would just be like, where do you place the blame at? At whose feet do you place the blame for taking the biggest amount, like the largest progressive movement that we've had? Uh, you know, I, I mean, from the time that I was 17, 18 years old, we had Bernie Sanders up until, you know, uh, when he, you know, bowed out and, you know, I mean, he's still around, but let's just be honest, it's a shadow of what it was. So that like five year block, right. right. Um, it was massive. It sprang up from the ground and you had people driving. I mean, I met a dude that flew from Australia to knock doors in, uh, in Iowa, Cedar mm -hmm. Rapids, Iowa, you know what I mean? People doing all kinds of crazy shit. 
uh, because they believed in what this could mean for not just America, but the rest of the world. That was an extremely powerful thing that we had at our fingertips. And we could get people to donate and we could get people to show up in droves and we could put, you know, uh, you know, rock stars on stages and fundraise for Bernie Sanders. Uh, we collectively the movement. Right. I never put Vampire Weekend on a stage. Yes. But, um, you know, uh, it, it, it just seems like we, we lost that. It all it, it all the bag was completely fumbled and now we're broke. And it's just like, how did you how did you have this fall from grace? And, and I'm just wondering, you know, how do we constructively reflect on that to make sure that it doesn't happen again? And, and where does the blame lie? Well, the, my first answer, and I don't know if this would count, but I'll tell you what it is. My first answer would be who, who, has, who had the most power and the most agency to make that, to, to make that, the moves that put the left in the place it is now. And that would be Barack Obama. You know, his, you know, if he had decided, you know what, um, we started out with, yes, we can, the party has moved left. We're going to finish it with, it's not me, us. Like this movement has shown that it is the force that can stand up to the, the MAGA movement. And if we're going to save democracy, we all need to rally behind this movement and either stays out or doesn't, and doesn't, doesn't, you know, coalesce the party around Joe Biden. Or just says, you know what? This I'm passing the baton to the to the progressive wing of the party, which I claim to have run as a representative of. Like that, like there's no greater kind of agency than you could have than than his at that moment. But then the question would be, do, does that even count? Because is at this point he was never going to do that. Right. He could have done that when is he was he he ever, president. Right? Is he ever going to do that? And and so to be so. You guys should have Jonathan Smucker on if if you haven't before. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with. Brilliant dude who wrote um, this book called Hegemony How to. He was an Occupy Occupy organizer, um, anti war organizer, then leading Occupy organizer, and he he coined this phrase and his that where he said that like the left in 2020 got to within what he called the margin of maneuver, like in other words, like they got out maneuvered. They didn't really get overpowered. They were they were close enough that with that you could imagine with some a couple different plays, like they're they're like on the brink of getting to power, and and now they're not, and and so, you know what like how did how did that happen, what what brought that about, like it, it's it's like an entire it's an entire book like the the party is really I think has changed so much since from twenty fifteen to today, like. The left has changed a lot from 2015 to today. Um, and so I don't, and I think so much of it is also like structural and cultural, like flowing through institutions in the way, the ways that things have, the ways that things have evolved over the last seven years. Like if you go back and look at Bernie Sanders 2015 announcement for president, it's all Occupy language. It's all millionaires and billionaires, the 1%, um, a healthcare for all. You, you you look at the left candidates today there's some of that but not much like it's it's all caught up in kind of culture war like battling over you know schools and uh obviously covid disrupted disrupted everything from a material and a cultural perspective in a massive way so i don't know i mean wh wh where would you where would you put it and then that's the thing I don't, we want like neoliberalism wants us to push everything into individual choices. What yeah. We, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I so, think, you know, so where, like, where, yeah, I think, you know, where I would, I would put a lot of the blame and, and I, I think that, look, I got, I got a lot of love for the man. We're, we're obviously nowhere close to where we're not having this conversation without him, but I look, I think there is an accountability factor with the, my good friend, Joe stuff. I think there's an accountability factor with the not allowing, you know, Zephyr teach out. Uh, or, you, you know, Interesting. So you, you, you think, I, I think like what he did wrong was but, uh, like, you know what? I, I guess everybody fucks up once. He shouldn't have bent the knee and gone and, and you know, gotten behind Hillary. I think in 2016, that was a mistake. But, uh, you know, the Trump hysteria, whatever. Like, I fucking voted for Hillary Clinton when I was 18 because of the Trump hysteria, right? Like, I, I fucking did. Um, I think, okay, fine. You take that L. You say, we're moving forward. But the second time with Joe Biden, you say, no, man. You say, no, we're, we're, we're going the we're going this way. We're doing it without you. Um, you know, the entire Democrats can, you know, you can all get behind Joe Biden, have him. 
uh, go up against me. I think I think that you know and he, he wouldn't have done would it, but run I run third party, but run third party or. Yeah, that way the mechanism, because you said now, how do we have the mechanisms to continue to uh, put the money where we need to, to say, hey, we got your back, even if Apex drags you through the mud. I think if Bernie, you know, it, it, it was like what our, our revolution kind of pitched itself to be. Uh, now they're just the pro practical progressives, which I freaking hate uh, that idea that, oh, oh, that we have to be pro practical. It's like, no, we have to give people what we need. But anyway, I, I, so, yeah, well, I, I, just, I just like saying, end, just like saying Obama, ready. but just like saying Obama never would have done what i laid out like bernie just it's just not him like he just that's the that's the bummer never, right never. right and I, I to be fair though ryan i don't think obama used necessarily the same kind of revolutionary language that bernie did i mean bernie was talking about a political revolution mm -hmm. and revolutions don't necessarily stop when you lose the nomination you know what i'm saying like the fact that he just basically gave up and walked away with his tail in between his legs rather than try to hoist this movement which he had built behind him into something lasting i do think is very disappointing even if it's understandable from like a political strategic perspective uh, but speaking of bernie sanders i did want to get into one last story and also if it's okay with you ryan i figured since we have like 10 15 minutes left we could take maybe a couple questions from the chat if anyone has any specific questions they wanted to ask you uh yeah. can open it up yeah, why don't you throw the questions in the chat? I got to piss. I'll be right back. Okay, no problem. Yeah, so if anyone has a question for Ryan, feel free to submit it via the chat, and hopefully we'll have time to get to it. Obviously, ask anything, but just try to be polite. We're not going to put anything super degrading or mean up on screen. So, you know, take that into consideration. But yeah, for the most part, anything goes. Submit your questions now uh, into the chat, and we'll ask Ryan when he gets back from urinating. Um, but something I did want to talk a little bit about and get Ryan's opinion on, hopefully, is this potential. Speaking of Bernie, you know, speak of the devil, uh, it does look like, you know, there are these rumors swirling about the potential of a 2024 run. Of course, we covered this on the Vanguard. Um, and, you know, Bernie Sanders' aide sent out this memo revealing that the Vermont senator had not closed the door to a third bid for president. They blasted it far and wide. And of course, this was intentional. This wasn't just some sort of a, you know, leak or like a oops, it accidentally got out. Like, no, this was, you know, clearly intentionally planned um, and leaked by his aides. And although it says uh, he has no current plans to run in 2024, no one should forget that he remains popular, is the undisputed leader of the progressive left, and that he must be a part of any conversation about a potential open Democratic presidential primary. And I think that kind of gets to the heart of the issue here, right? It says that he is the undisputed leader of the progressive left. There really is no one that has uh, inherited uh, his status as the movement leader. And despite all of our issues with Bernie and the way we laid out that he kind of let his movement dissipate, I, I think that's true. You know, he still is the undisputed leader of the progressive left, at least when it comes to electoral politics. Um, so I think it's uh, only right for him to be involved in this conversation, despite his advanced age, despite the fact that it would be his third run for the presidency. If there is an open primary, I have to be honest, I, I hope that Bernie does get involved because, you know, without him, there isn't going to be a left option on stage. There is not going to be anyone arguing for Medicare for all or the policies that we so desperately need. There's not going to be anyone making an anti-corruption argument in a serious way. So, uh, you know, that that's my opinion on this. But again, while we wait for some questions from the chat for Ryan, uh, what was your response to this, Ryan? And do you think it's a good idea or do you think it would just kind of be like an embarrassing, like, why the fuck is this old guy trying to become president for a third time? If, if I mean, if it's Bernie versus Trump, like he might as well, like, and, you know, Biden's out for whatever reason, I might as well keep keep your options open. Like, it seems it seems doable um because who like the the bench is like non-existent like who else is going to run it's yeah that's the one gotta thing to have somebody run that's the one thing that makes it feel like god damn it like obviously they'll they will make somebody run and that's why i think that they'll carry joe biden out there even if he's just a bag of fucking crusty bones uh because if if you do imagine uh the 2020 primary field without joe biden um you know who 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 else was there they haven't had any newcomers come to the stage so it's like do i think that bernie sanders could wipe the floor with kamala and pete and amy klobuchar and 
um, Beto O'Rourke and, you know, whoever else is going to Mark Cuban, whoever else decides to run. I, I do think that he could do that. Um, so, it, but I just, I just don't think that he, I, I, I would want him to do it regardless of whether or not Joe Biden runs now that he is a empty bag of bones that everybody knows is not going to restore balance to our fucking country. Like they, like he promised. Um, but I, I definitely uh, have mixed feelings about how he would behave if he actually did this in practice. And also the number of democratic senators he would need to get anything done would be like 60 or 65 because like Joe Manchin was at least willing to vote for like that American rescue plan, that $1.9 trillion thing at the beginning. If Bernie were president, I can't see Joe Manchin voting for anything that gets sent over to Congress. So unless he gets some political revolution, which, which sweeps in a whole bunch of senators and the, and the like dynamic really changes, it would still be useful just to see what a actually kind of left progressive uh foreign policy would look Mm -hmm. like yeah i totally agree with that it would would be it'd be painful too though because it's still an empire even if right if you even if you have bernie at the helm of right yeah i don't know if you saw that quote from obama that he's he's, he supposedly said to bernie about how like bernie you're a old testament prophet uh Mm -hmm. prophets don't get to be kings yeah. You know, because because kings have to make the hard decisions. They have to run the empire, so to speak. Uh, so even though that was super condescending, you know, there is kind of a grain of truth there where it's like even if Bernie did become president, he would still be president of like an empire. And there's <laughs> going to be some like, you know, bad things that go on, even with the most progressive person leading. So it, it is an interesting conversation to have. It does look like we got a couple interesting <clears throat> questions for you. Ryan, that I would love to hear your answer to. So I, I know we're running up on an hour sure. here. Get, get out of here literally whenever you have to. Um, but this one's an interesting question that I think gets to some people's um, some people's disagreements with your philosophy. And I think it's I think you describe yourself as like a democratic socialist, right? I guess I I I, I don't know. All right, <laughs> I well, really think too he's much. an orthodox Marxist Leninist. Gosh, there, there you go. <laughs> now it's. All right. Well, Alex is wondering, uh, Brian, do you think we can transcend capitalism by voting? So assuming that you agree, at least to some extent, that we have to transcend capitalism, um, how are we going to do that? And is it by voting? Well, you know who did believe that there was one country that could do a, uh, re- a revolution at the ballot box? That was Karl Marx in America. Like, he, he I, I forget exactly where he said this, but he was like, there's only one place. There's only one country right now where you wouldn't necessarily need a, an, act, an actual violent revolution because the workers have the franchise. And if the workers could collectively organize and, and in a move and elect a socialist government, they could turn, they could take, they could use that government and dominate capitalism with it. Um, he will see if he turns out to be right. He hasn't been right yet. Um, but so in theory, that's what Marx thought. Um, now, like what would, what would capital do in the event that a vote like that took place? I mean, you know, I think, that, you know, they would, you, you see what they did just to the campaign of a democratic socialist who just wants to expand healthcare insurance to everybody not even not even the delivery delivery is still privatized but they're just going to make the insurance public and they're like oh no 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 this you know this must be stopped um so i so i mean i i people have a- absolutely voted dictatorships into power like that has happened um so if you can do it on the right theoretically you should be able to do it on the left yeah now, the, i mean the right the right is obviously doing it hand in glove with major sources of corporate power right so well, i mean th- that kind of reminds me of something we were talking about recently whereas people always say oh there's no chance at all that bernie could ever win the democratic nomination and i kind of disagree with that because i think that in the same way they tried to uh or they successfully you know rigged it against bernie i think they tried just as hard to rig it against Trump on the Republican mm-hmm. side in the same way that Obama waited in to get involved uh, against Bernie. You know, Mitt Romney, the previous nominee of the Republican Party, absolutely waited in 
to, you know, try to turn voters against Trump. So, you know, both sides tried to rig it just to differing degrees of success. And I think a big part of the reason that Donald Trump was able to overcome that in a way that Bernie Sanders was not is that Donald Trump was running pretty openly against the Republican establishment. I guess Bernie was, too. But Trump was unafraid to say things like, I'm not going to endorse the eventual nominee. I'm not going to you know, play this game with you guys in the event that you fuck me. Uh, Bernie never did that. Bernie mm-hmm. never really ran against his party leadership with quite, quite the same aggressiveness. And I think that could have potentially uh, helped overcome those odds. Um, but that being said, we have one more super chat that I wanted to shout out and get your response to, Ryan. Uh, Aka, Aka says, if Bernie signed truly progressive executive orders, it would help push Congress to pass progressive legislation, or he could threaten them with those. Um I'm not sure if this commenter is saying in the event that he was president. Right. But he's, he's just... saying, right. He's saying in the event that he's got a hostile Congress, he could say, well, I'm going to do by executive order all of these things. Yeah, there, there's a lot of power um, in the executive branch that if he was serious about deploying it, could could coerce a Congress to to work with him. He'd also be up against the entire media apparatus. You know. Yeah, and and also the CIA, he might get the Kennedy treatment in the back <laughs> yes. of a fucking Cadillac somewhere. I, look, guys, I I joke about this a lot, but I always I I always I always like to joke that like if I were Bernie Sanders, I would have done it a lot differently. But I would have had to scrape up my brains from the fucking floor <laughs> in Iowa after I first campaigned there. Like you know, they're just yeah, you run around and you're saying fuck you all this. You give me one branch of power and putting twenty five motherfuckers just like me on the Supreme Court, and uh, we're stealing the means of production. Like of course they're gonna assassinate you. This is America. But anyway. Yeah. Um, Brian, it was a real pre- pleasure having you on the show today, man. Uh, I pr- appreciate you sticking it out, even though you're feeling a little under the weather and uh, come to hang out with us. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. See you later. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Really appreciate it. Always enjoy chatting. I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Uh, you too. Good luck, guys. Thanks, Take Ryan. Care. Yeah, that was a great interview. Really, really enjoyed talking with Ryan Grimm, as always. Um, really appreciate the fact that he's uh, able and willing to agree or uh, to uh, engage with people he doesn't always agree with 100% of the time. And we've always been open about our areas of disagreement here on the Vanguard. So I'm extra impressed with the fact that he has thick skin um, and, and wasn't you know offended initially when we went after him. Instead, no, he uh, embraced the debate, embraced the dialogue, which is something that I think we need more of on the left. So really appreciate chatting with Ryan. Thanks again for stopping by and really appreciate everyone for commenting along in the chat as well. It looks like we did get a couple more super chats to quickly address. Thank you so much, Bill, for the $5. Here's a question uh, specifically, I think, tailored for me, although I'm sure Zach has a you know a lot of input as well. Best David Lynch film, Blue Velvet. Um, whew, so as you guys might know, David Lynch is my favorite filmmaker far and away. There's really no competition for me at least david lynch is my favorite artist um and blue velvet is one of my top five movies of all time it really depends on my mood though you know sometimes i am more in the mood for blue velvet um it has those kind of like small town vibes that i really enjoy Um, but actually lately lost highway i think is probably uh, my favorite david lynch movie that's the one i've really been watching the most lately uh something about its nocturnal vibes really I really fuck with. So yeah, right now I'm feeling Lost Highway, um, but it's really just a matter of my mood. Like I said, it it used to be Mulholland Drive 100%, um, but for some reason lately, like I said, I've kind of gone in a different direction, although I still hold that film in utmost esteem. Yeah, I I guess if, uh, you know, it's tough, right? Because he does have a a lot of classics, right? Uh, If Maybe if if I could argue that he considers season one of Twin Peaks uh, a film, uh, that might be my favorite. Uh, but if we're talking traditional film, Mulholland Drive. Uh, but I, I have a lot of love for that. I mean, and not just the first season, like a lot of the second season and then the return also as well. But something about like Gavin mentioned, the small town vibes. That's one of the things I love about Twin Peaks, the atmosphere. I'm a big like hang out with the television kind of a person just to create like that good vibe or like the community in your house when you're like cooking or like cleaning or something. And I feel like Twin Peaks just has a really certain way of of making you feel like good, you know, and, and um uh, so, so that's another one. But yeah, Mulholland Drive, I think, is maybe one of the single greatest pieces of filmmaking of all time, uh, just as far as... Execution. I would argue that that applies to almost every David Lynch film. <laughs> sure, yeah. 
per, for me personally, I would say that I think Mulholland Drive does, uh, you know, for its ambition, uh, stand a, a little bit out of David Lynch's uh, filmography. But I know you could make a really unique case for a lot of his films of Racerhead, Blue Velvet. Uh, Gavin made the case for Lost Highway, uh, the Twin Peaks, The Return, obviously groundbreaking for all kinds of reasons, really a 17 hour film. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's uh, endless talk. We could do a whole David Lynch podcast for like weeks. Yeah, Inland Empire as well is one that gets slept on a lot because it is more experimental. Although I would argue it, Inland Empire is just as good, just as ambitious as a film like Mulholland Drive. In fact, it's more ambitious, to be honest. It's far more ambitious. So yeah, Inland Empire is one not to be ignored either. Um, but really, it, it comes down to your mood. Like I said, um, depending on the day, I would say either Mulholland Drive, Blue Velvet, Lost Highway, or Inland Empire uh, a racer head as well so basically, just any of his films yeah basically basically any of his films uh, Fuck but, the elephant man but every- <laughs> <laughs> the elephant man is great too and i even defend dune so you know that's me I'm, I'm the number one david lynch fan though on the left at least but thank you so much bill for the five dollars always appreciate engaging with a fellow lynch head um and i'd be interested to know if if your favorite is blue velvet so comment below david if in fact blue velvet is your favorite in which case very understandable it's an absolute masterpiece truly a perfect movie uh no one can tell me otherwise in fact it is one of the most perfect movies from a narrative perspective ever made so thank you so much for the five dollars bill really appreciate that thank you also Corey wiley for the five bucks i wonder if bernie incorporated a left ubi it would gain him votes from yang i mean i'm sure it would have however andrew yang i don't think ever got more than like a couple percentage points in any given um primary so even though i'm a supporter of ubi i don't really know that like andrew yang's support would have like carried bernie over the finish line either no it didn't do anything for tulsi gabbard either remember when he was like i'll endorse anybody who gets behind ubi in that fucking 30 seconds later she's like, yeah i support ubi guys don't worry andrew yang's gonna fucking endorse me and then he was like well okay actually i endorse joe biden anyway but um yeah, it didn't do much for her. I think she went from like one to two percent max. It was not uh, a, a bump, and and I don't even think he ever actually endorsed her uh, to be uh, to end that out. But yeah, so I don't think it would have made much of a difference. Um, and also, I just think that Bernie's brand was uh, already like focused on the specific policies that he'd laid out. So I think adding another policy like that uh, would have. I mean, yes, it would have gotten him some support, but it also would have opened the door to more criticism from the right. Like, oh, Bernie Sanders is just running the free shit party. Blah 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 blah. So, you know, I, I don't think it was going to save him after Joe Biden coalesced around the fucking, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the Democratic Party coalesced around Joe Biden is what I mean. Right. Thank you so much for the five bucks, Corey. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Das Bosa Fleisch, for the four ninety nine. I saw Van Guardian, Susan Sarandon, again yesterday at the Donzinger stream. I'm still amazed she doesn't age. Yeah, that's awesome. I also saw that she was out um, at the little Steve Donzinger celebration in New York City obviously celebrating his freedom which is so fucking awesome um so that's that's great she's been one of the loudest and best voices advocating for steve donzinger's freedom um and of course we're so so proud to say that she's a supporter of the vanguard as well our first ever patron so huge shout out to susan sarandon and you're right of course that she looks absolutely amazing for her age yeah man a real queen and whenever anybody that's like friends with my mom or is like what do you do for work i'm like oh you know i just run this podcast news and surrounded loves it and then you know that that'll always oh and i'm kidding of course but she doesn't i don't know how often she listens to our show but she does support us so that's dope and uh, appreciate that five dollars das bos fleisch uh she truly doesn't age and apparently she's also going to be like a villain in a dc movie coming up she got cast in a big role so i was like oh and she's still going after it so she's gonna uh, be in uh let me let me just uh double check this really quickly uh, I want to make sure I get the name right of the role that she's going to be in. Um, either way, I don't remember. It was on Consequence of Sounds. Fuck me. She's going to be in a new movie, so she's still acting uh, at her age, which is cool, too. Interesting. Yeah, speaking of David Lynch, actually, there was a rumor that she might be in a project he is potentially working on. So that would also be dope. I'd love to see her join a Lynch project. And speaking of Lynch, we did get a chat from Adam saying, are you guys excited for the restoration of Inland Empire? Yes, I actually saw the restoration of Inland Empire on the big screen. Absolutely stunning. Absolutely amazing experience. Um, Highly recommend anyone check it out if there's a showing in your hometown. Uh, Great, great restoration. If anyone doesn't know, this film was shot Uh, on a digital handheld camcorder so the quality is pretty low compared to your traditional high definition uh, cinematography 
but there's a new restoration out where they painstakingly restored uh, the, the quality of the footage to the point where it actually looks pretty normal. You can still tell in some shots that it's handheld, but uh, it still looks damn good. So yeah, I highly recommend everyone check out that restoration. Inland Empire is such a fucking masterpiece. It's uh, finally getting a bit of a critical reappraisal, finally getting the uh, attention it deserves as one of David Lynch's masterpieces. So anyway, thanks for the question. Always love talking about David Lynch. Um, but yeah, we can probably get out of here. Yeah, I did find the new movie that uh, throw this up really quickly. This is Blue Beetle. It looks like a big blockbuster, which is why I was like, damn, you're she's the number one build on it. It's going to be her and George Lopez and this uh, story of a Hispanic teenager that finds an alien beetle that gives him super powered armor. So very much in the lane of blockbusters uh, nowadays. So interest, interestingly enough, I just wanted to throw that up there because I thought that was interesting. Yeah, when I hear Blue Beetle, all I think about is that pest control company. There's a Where Zach and I live in Kansas City, there's a pretty popular pest control company called Blue Beetle. And they like literally drive around blue beetles, like Volkswagen beetles with like yellow antennas on top to make it look like an insect. Uh, so when I hear Blue Beetle, all I think about is like pest extermination. But that's super cool. If you've got a pesky problem, they're going to solve it. <laughs> no, but anyway, uh, shout out to everybody that tuned in today. Uh, appreciated everybody that uh, got a little Maldine in the chat. That's always fun. Uh, but no, uh, this was a great interview. Great chat. And, uh, you know, we'll have Ryan back on the show. Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, Switch, that we did not ask Ryan your question. <laughs> Although it is an interesting question. Thanks for the two bucks. I and got yeah. 10 on the fact that it's real. I would give it a yank confident. Yeah, it looks it looks pretty real. It looks pretty good to me. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. Uh, we tried to throw some hard balls at Ryan and also just chat about some areas of agreement as well. But as you guys know, we always appreciate the fact that he's willing to engage with us despite our disagreements. He's always willing to debate and engage. So appreciate that. And honestly, you know, we were talking a little bit about Kim Iverson. I I'd love to chat with Kim as well on the vanguard because similarly we disagree about a lot but i think she's a good faith actor and i appreciate hearing her perspective on rising just like ryan so you know maybe we can get an interview with kim set up too i'd, I'd love to do that yeah definitely and um drew stanko pointing out i don't know who cuts my hair but they suck so take that the barbarette anyway yeah you guys have a great rest of your tuesday we're yammering at this point so we'll get the hell out of here but yeah big shout out to the patron community almost forgot to do that thank you guys so much for your support wouldn't be able to do the vanguard without the support of the patron community so if you guys enjoy the stream if you guys enjoy the content we create uh consider hitting up that link it's in the description it's patreon.com slash the vanguard channel as i say we would not be able to do the show without the support of our patron community. So huge shout out. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate that as always. Um, you guys keep the show going. So everyone peace out. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you later.